the beginning, there was nothing but an egg, which hatched into Arceus, also known as the Pokemon God. Arceus created Giratina, Dialga, and Palkia to administer the powers of antimatter, time, and space. Where Dialga and Palkia created the basis for the world, Giratina was eventually banished by Arceus to the distortion world for its violence. With their labors complete, Dialga and Palkia retreated to their dimensions, while Arceus continued its mission, creating three Lake Guardians. More legendary Pokémon like Kyogre, Groudon, were formed from the depths of the world, filling the seas with water and creating land. Rayquaza, the third of these floated high in the ozone layer and intervened whenever the two arch enemies clashed. The only other Pokémon known from these times were the Mews found around the world, and Regigigas, who with his strength shaped the many regions and created three Titan Pokémon, Regirock, Regice, and Registeel of clay, ice, and magma. The era of creation drew to a close as Arceus went into slumber upon creating three time-space orbs. Hundreds of millions of years passed, and the once great Mew population slowly declined. The first humans appeared, and the few Pokémon in the era of creation became many as prehistoric types such as Kabuto, Kabutops, and Aerodactyl appeared, ruled for 200 million years, and went extinct following a meteorite impact. Only the first Pokémon bird, Arkan, and the turtle Pokémon, Tirtuga, were left to thrive and marked the beginning for a new line of Pokémon. Hundreds of millions of additional years and countless evolutions passed until the end of the last Ice Age, which led to another reduction of the number of existing Pokémon. The humans, who by now had settled most of the world, worshipped several of the legendary Pokémon or magical creatures. One of these was Regigigas until they realized the threat that his powers posed to the Pokémon world. Fearing the unknown, they sealed him and the Rock Titans away. But darker times were looming. A few thousand years passed until a ferocious war broke out between two rivaling factions in the province of Kalos. Nevertheless, instead of sending out soldiers to settle their differences, they sent out their Pokémon to do the battles for them. The terrible conflict resulted in the death of many Pokémon, including King Az's Floette. Bearing witness to this horrible sight, the mighty Az built a machine to revive the fallen Floette. Filled with guilt, he couldn't forgive the responsible parties for the bloody war, and in his anger transformed the machine of life to an ultimate weapon. Despite being aware of its consequence, Az fired without remorse the weapon to put an end to the war. Floette was brought back to life, but the plan backfired horribly as accidentally the machine would grant immortality to his Floette and himself. When Floette learned about this selfish act, she abandoned her master. The destruction that followed was so great that it caused a rift in time and space itself and led to the creation of two different multiverses. In the first instance, the energy unleashed impacted specific stones out in space, creating megastones while in the other multiverse, none such thing occurred as the Kalos War never took place. In the outcome where the Megastones came into existence, this event would mark the origin of Mega Evolution. One thousand years passed since the Kalos War, and due to meteorite showers of the Megastones in the Hoenn region, Kyogre and Groudon woke up from their slumbers in their primal forms and resumed their fight for world domination. Once again, Rayquaza intervened, but this time it was a result of pleads from the ancient Draconid tribe. In the Mega Evolution universe, when another meteor shower 1,000 years later caused Kyogre and Groudon to fight for the primal source, Rayquaza performed the first Mega Evolution and quelled the two arch enemies. Around the same time, in the Unova region, there once was a kingdom where the royal family had for a long time ruled the land 
with the mysterious dragon. This balance of power maintained until the day when two successor princes ended up in a dispute over what should define their land, truth or ideals. As a result of this division, the original dragon split into Reshiram and Zekrom to serve each of the princes, while Qrem was left as the empty husk of the original dragon. A decisive confrontation between the two brothers took place as Reshiram and Zekrom fought but were unable to conquer one another. As a result, the brothers set away their differences in an utterly ruined Unova. Warning, the first game entry in the Pokemon timeline spoils the story and backstory of Pokemon Legends Arceus. If you don't want to be spoiled, jump to the next timestamp which begins at this moment on the screen. We will give you 5 seconds to jump to that point before we dive into the 25th anniversary Pokemon Game Changer. In one of the multiverses or dimensions, and within this one of the land of creation, was Hisui, the future Sinnoh equivalent to our 19th century. It remains unknown whether this is a brand new multiverse from the non-mega evolution universe where we find Diamond and Pearl and possibly Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Though at the same time it seems pretty clear that this one is distinct from the multiple mega evolution multiverses. Anyhow, for some reason, the disturbed Arceus was setting a plan in motion from his divine realm. Summoning a child which might have been Lucas or Dawn from a different time and space or multiverse that he or she was sent to. With one clear task, seek out and catch all Pokemon in the region of origin just like the ancient hero had done before him or her. A world where advanced Pokeballs of steam and wood surfaced earlier. As a product of the industrial revolution from the Galaxy team, which under Commander Kamado's leadership began their mission to tame the terrifying wild Pokemon. At first, this came at a great cost as the original Galaxy settlement went up in flames and the entire team relocated to the northern Hisui region where two clans, the Diamond of Time and the Pearl of Space, were in open conflict over which represented the almighty Sinnoh. This was the reality that Commander Kamado arrived to, founding Jubilife Village for his organization and any other settlers in the southwestern corner of Hisui. Here urban human activity bustled, but not far beyond apart from the security corps, whose task was to rescue Survey Corps members whenever they wandered out into the Pokemon-dominated wilderness. The latter was under the leadership of Captain Selene, who worked closely together with the Pokemon expert Professor Laventon, and then with either Akari or Ray, depending on the boy or girl multiverse. All to charter and tame the areas where wardens under the command of Anamon and the newly elected Irida took care of the ten noble Pokemon. Each of them protected Hisui in the name of the almighty Sinnoh and were revered at Coronet Temple. It was to this time and space of origins that Arceus, after transforming the modern smartphone into the Arc Phone, dropped likely Lucas or Dawn, or an equivalent of, from the time-space rift. The child from a different time and space was by accident found by Professor Laventon, who ended up on Prelude Beach after three Pokémon he had brought to Hisui ran away. Realizing that this lost child from the sky with amnesia was special and with a clear goal to seek out all the Pokémon. He tasked him or her to catch the three Pokemon before returning back to Jubilife Village. There he or she met either Akari or Ray of the Survey Corps and his or her leader, Captain Selene, who accepted that the child could join the Corps if it could pass an initiation trial with the starter Pokemon, Cyndaquil, Rowlet, or Oshawott. With this introduction cleared, the child joined the Galaxy team and settled down in Jubilife right before lightning struck the noble lords and the Soul Lady in their arenas. Thus, Kamado, after being consulted by Ataman and Irida, gradually tasks the new prodigy to calm down the frenzied Pokémon. Together with Professor Laventon and followed by the obsessed with Hisui's past, Volo, the child traveled first to the Obsidian Fieldlands, where he or she obtained a Celestica flute from Ataman to call Warden Mize Weirdeer and face Cleaver after convincing leader Irida to clear it of its frenzy. Completing these missions, plus collecting and battling enough Pokémon, granted a higher rank and permission to travel to new corners of the region. 
This way, the child reached Crimson Mirelands, where Warden Calaba's writable Ursa Luna and Warden Arezu's frenzied Lilligant awaited. Overcoming these obstacles and the bandits consisting of Galaxy, Diamond, and Pearl defectors brought the child and Arezu back to Jubilai, where Arezu became the village's new hairstylist. Kamado then ordered and Selene granted permission to reach the Cobalt Coastlands and within it, Firespit Island. An area without a frenzied noble as the previous one had been lost to the waves while rescuing its child. A tragedy that had deeply impacted Pearl Warden Palina, who herself had to be rescued by Diamond Warden Isken and his Basku Legion. Needless to say, the two grew feelings for each other. By the time the child from the sky arrived across the waters, Iskin and Polina helped willingly as the Galaxy team was a uniting force between the clans. What they didn't expect, though, was that the bandit trio would abduct one of Polina's growlithes and attempt to evolve at Firespit Island. As fate wanted at Firespit Arena, the lost noble's son confronted the bandits who had abused his friend and then evolved to become the new noble, Arcanine, which naturally also ended up frenzied after another lightning strike. The child from the same sky with bulbs made by Arena and Polina calmed down the successor and with it allowed the spirit of its deceased father to pass on. With all matters resolved and a new rank obtained, things turned out quite differently at the Coronet Highlands. The Pearl Warden, as a fellow time and space immigrant from the sky, showed great understanding and admiration for the child from the sky, while the Diamond Warden showed lack of tolerance. Locking the path to her frenzied noble, which could only be reached after Igor granted the child the expert noble climber Sneasler. With Melly defeated, Electrode could finally be calmed and the child after a tiresome journey could set out for the even colder Alabaster Icelands where the final frenzied noble Avalug awaited. Though reaching him with balms of his favorite food turned out to be a challenge as Diamond Warden Sabi wanted to play cat and mouse with the Galaxy veteran a chase which ended on top of Snowpoint Temple, where at last Hisuian bravery opened the path to calm down Warden Garrick's Avalug. The last noble had been calmed, but when peace at last appeared to be achieved, the sky went wild. Accusing the child of everything that had transpired, Commander Kamado didn't listen to Ataman and Arita, who banished the outsider from the Survey Corps and village. Unable to gain any help from the Diamond and Pearl Wardens, the child was approached by Volo, who brought him or her to Mistress Kogida. She had a clear goal to mend the rift in space-time, and with it tasked the Wanderer to seek out the three Lake Guardians in order to obtain the Red Chain. Even so, not everyone in the Diamond and Pearl Clans and the Galaxy Team abandoned the child from a different space and time. Captain Selene sent her Abra while Ataman and Erida came personally to aid and one of them as selected by the Wanderer joined with Volo in their search after the Lake Guardians, who after some initial trolling bestowed the Red Chain. With it, after the child was restored to the Survey Corps, the two clans rushed for Mount Coronet, where the Banished faced the commander in order to challenge and catch Dialga or Palkia. Though this didn't turn out to be enough, as in order to restore balance, you needed both space and time, or time and space, and thus the enraged Dialga or Palkia surfaced. Everyone was forced to retreat, but with Balms and the original Balm, the child from the same sky was able to calm down time or space counterpart and catch it with the origin Balm. Unfortunately, the same could not be said about the Temple of Sinnoh, which was in ruins. Still, the world had been saved from tearing itself apart, so a festival was in order. But with this one concluded, it was time to address the mission from Arceus. Seeking out the legendaries, receive their plates, and complete the Pokédex, a task which Volo volunteered to assist with. The Hisui legendaries, starting with the Lake Guardians, were all caught, and with it, all plates were in the hands of the Wanderer from the sky. Everything seemed to go smoothly as the Pokédex was completed, but as investigations regarding the banished Giratina surfaced, Volo, as the ancestor of Cynthia, unleashed the final act of his elaborate scheme tricking the time and space traveling child to return to the ruined temple of Sinnoh at Mount Coronet's peak and offer the 17 collected plates. Columns cracked and broken, pillars now shaped like spears stabbing into the heavens, but no Giratina in sight as Volo had already allied with it in the distortion world and held the 18th plate. 
revealing his true psychopathic self as the mastermind who orchestrated the space-time rift and all its consequences in order to meet the creator Arceus in battle with Giratina by his side, subjugating its power and creating a new world, undoing Hisui, all the other regions, and everyone living in it, as if they never existed. The battle for the world was about to take place, and with the same frightening Pokémon that Cynthia used in her time and space to reign as champion of Sinnoh, Volo aimed to humiliate the Wanderer. However, it failed, so he unleashed Giratina from the Distortion World, which also failed, infuriating Volo, who as a descendant of the ancient Sinnoh people had done everything he could to enrage Dialga and Palkia and drag the creator of everything out from hiding. Summoning a trainer who battles alongside Pokémon to counter the great wielder of Pokémon in this time and space. Understanding this, Volo handed over the 18th plate to Arceus as chosen one and accepted that his journey was over. With it, the Celestica Flute transformed into the Azure Flute, and the time had come to face the creator of all Pokémon. Volo wouldn't accept it, but his scheming only resulted in telling his descendants about Giratina and they had a different point of view from him. Cynthia fought against the evil that Cyrus, Captain Selene's descendant, aimed to unleash. But back to Arceus, who at the end of the Stairway of the Heavens awaited the arrival of the child he had brought to this world, first testing and then congratulating on seeking out all the Pokémon of the region of origin, just like the ancient hero once did, he and the Pokémon that walked beside him. The struggle was over as Arceus bestowed a part of himself so that he could walk together with the one he entrusted everything to foil Volo's plan. Receiving the 19th and final plate from the deity of the Pokémon universe himself, the Pokédex was complete, and with it the timeline of the remaining games began as Commander Kamado began to study Pokémon himself and his descendants, including Rowan, became the professor of the region. Selene became the new commander of the Galaxy team setting her bloodline on the path of power that would lead to the tragedy of the kind but misguided Cyrus. But that is a story that will be told another day. Sorry, force of habit. Later on in this timeline. With technological advancements, Pokeballs became more and more refined in the coming years, decades, and even centuries. So to regulate and professionalize a growing gambling industry of battles, official Pokemon leagues were set up in the different regions. To enter these, a trainer had to travel across the particular region to obtain gym leader badges. The popularity of the sport exploded, but with a lucrative multi-billion dollar business on the rise, it was bound that dishonest souls would attempt to exploit the situation. This resulted in the creation of multiple criminal organizations aimed to steal Pokémon from trainers and blackmail executives. The most notorious of these was the Kanto-based Team Rocket, headed by the trainer-turned-businessman Giovanni. Rocket quickly grew to notoriety for organized theft and sale of rare and valuable Pokémon on an industrial scale. Resorting to brutal methods against Pokémon and their trainers, the team was bent to conquer the world, but its leader had a completely different obsession, namely the legendary Mew. Following long searches, Giovanni and his scientists finally managed to replicate and alter the DNA of Mew to give birth to the ultimate Pokémon, Mew 2. Upon learning its origins, it turned against the scientists and made its way to the Cerulean Cave. In this harsh reality, the renowned Pokémon researcher Professor Oak from Palatown prepared three starter Pokémon for three very special trainers. Red, his grandson Blue, and Leaf Green. Upon picking their Charmander, Squirtle, and Bulbasaur, they were tasked to complete the Pokédex, while Blue, who was bent on tormenting his rival, challenged Red for a battle on the way to the Pewter City and Cerulean City Gyms, where the two earned their first badges upon beating Brock and Misty. Red continued his journey, earning the Thunder Badge, and got to Lavender Town, where he took on Team Rocket and together with Blue solved the mystery of the Haunted Tower. This resulted in the touching reunion between an orphan baby Cubone with the spirit of its murdered mother. From here on out, Red defeated four more gym leaders and confronted the Team Rocket boss Giovanni twice. 
One of them involved a face-off at the Silk Company for the precious Master Ball. Red continued his journey. On Cinnabar Island, he learned about the identity of an entirely new Pokémon, but nothing could prepare him for the leader in the eighth and final gym in Viridian City, the Team Rocket Mafia boss, Giovanni. After a long and hard-fought battle, Red finally defeated the criminal mastermind and taught him a lesson on what Pokémon are truly about. This led to a change of heart from Giovanni, who decided to disband Team Rocket. Red conquered Victory Road and defeated the Elite Four of the Pokémon League at Indigo Plateau. Only one challenge remained, the current champion, Blue. The time had come for the ultimate battle. After using up their remaining Pokémon, was time for the final showdown. Fire against Water, Charizard versus Blastoise. Both had come a long way, but only one had an unbreakable bond. This difference turned decisive as Red defeated his arch-rival Blue, becoming a true Pokémon champion. But the journey was far from over as the Pokédex had yet to be completed and Red resumed his quest catching legendary Pokémon such as Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres, and set course for the Cerulean Cave and Mewtwo. The battle against the Psychic Master was immensely tough as Mewtwo continued to regenerate, so much so that in some of the outcomes, Red had to use his Master Ball, while in others, he used all his abilities to weaken Mewtwo and capture the ultimate Pokémon the regular way. The outcome was still the same as Red had completed the Pokédex, with exception of catching Mew, that is. Wonder if it is still under that truck. Well, at least in that universe, since the Kanto struggle against Team Rocket took place in several alternate Pokémon universes where Mega Evolutions don't exist, and multiverses where Mega Evolutions do exist because of King AZ's action. In the ones where Mega Evolutions did not exist, we know of at least three alternate universes, two of them involving a different Red, Blue, and a female trainer known as Lee, which involved further adventures afterwards, and then another one tied to a special Pikachu. Anyhow, these are just examples that the Pokémon universe does not only consist of one universe, and that these again have two main categories, those where Mega Evolution exists and others which it doesn't. We will get back to Mega Evolutions when we conclude the timeline without Mega Evolutions, but for now, let's get back to the original non-Mega Evolution timeline involving Red and Professor Oak. Around the same time in the Hoenn region, two other trainers, May and Brendan, were about to set off on their quests and discover the dark secrets of the province. Norman, the father of either May or Brendan, depending on the universe or reality you play in, had recently taken over the position as the leader of the Petalburg Gym and sent his child to his friend Professor Birch to pick his or her starter Pokémon Trico, Torchic, or Mudkip. Upon saving the Professor from a pack of wild Poochiena by using one of the starter Pokémon, which differed based on the universe and realities they were set in, Norman's child was allowed to keep the Pokémon used in the battle and depart to claim the eight gym badges and challenge the Elite Four of the Hoenn province. Nevertheless, two opposing criminal organizations, Team Magma headed by Maxi and Team Aqua headed by Archie, had set their goal in the next meteorite shower to awaken the two legendary Pokémon, Groudon and Kyogre. Meanwhile, May or Brendan awoke the legendary rock titans of Hoenn, Regice, Registeel, and Regirock, battled the mini grunts and admins, and slowly learned that the two teams aimed to use the red and blue orbs to summon Groudon and Kyogre to respectively expand landmass for humans and expand the amount of water. Despite being warned in three alternate universes, the team leaders awoke the sleeping giants. This was a massive mistake, as the ancient Pokémon had no interest in obeying the teams and headed to Sutopolis City, causing the weather to go wild. 
the ultimate showdown was about to take place. Luckily, when all seemed lost, Brendan or May hurried to awaken Ray Quaza that flew off and separated the two, thus preventing further devastation. With all eight badges, the time finally arrived for May or Brendan to challenge and beat the Elite Four, and then the current Hoenn Pokemon League champion, Steven. Brendan or May were then inducted into the Hall of Fame. Three years passed until in the neighboring region of Johto, two new trainers with quite different principles were about to set out on their great adventure. The young Gold had just picked his starter Pokemon from Professor Elm when he caught Silver stealing from the laboratory and challenged him to a battle. Upon this first encounter, Gold set out to claim the eight badges of Johto. On the way, Gold encountered Kurt, a special Pokeball maker, persuaded the young trainer to fight against the restored Team Rocket. In an attempt to reach their missing leader, Rocket Grunts hijacked a radio station and transmitted a plea to him. Three long years had passed since international police forces stormed the Viridian Gym, which Giovanni had just abandoned. Traveling from gym to gym, Gold encountered Silver on numerous occasions and battled Team Rocket members who attempted to locate Giovanni. Upon their decisive defeat, Gold captured the legendary Ho-Oh, or Lugia, after being entrusted the Clear Bell at the Tin Tower. Finally, he encountered Suicune after awakening the other legendary beasts, Raiko and Entei, from their slumber at the Burn Tower. With all eight badges, Gold returned to Professor Elm, who handed him a Master Ball and told him to head for Kanto. Gold crossed Victory Road, beat Silver one last time, and finally challenged and defeated the Elite Four and the current Pokemon champion, Lance. Gold was greeted by Professor Oak and inducted into the Pokemon Hall of Fame, and then went on to challenge the eight gyms of the Kanto region. With all eight Kanto badges, Gold was finally granted passage by Professor Oak to Route 28 and up to Mount Silver, where a true Pokemon master awaited. Red with his Pikachu, Lapras, Venusaur, Blastoise, Snorlax, and Charizard was an incredible final challenge to take on by Gold, but he still went on to challenge the legendary Red. The exhausting and decisive battle begun, and the two masters followed each other Pokemon by Pokemon, dealing one spectacular blow after the other. In the end, each of them had only one Pokemon left. To this day, it is unknown who came out triumphant from this battle, but it is assumed that Red, following this battle, went on an extensive quest across the world. It is also worth mentioning that the Johto struggle against Team Rocket also took place, but in slightly different forms in alternate universes. During the events involving Gold and Silver in Johto, a mysterious Red Gyarados was sighted in the Lake of Rage an event that was televised and viewed around the same time by the soon-to-be trainers Lucas and Dawn, who soon after selected their starter Pokémon from Professor Round of the Sinnoh region. Just like in the three previous cases, Lucas or Dawn had to claim all the region badges, fight an evil organization named Team Galactic, and then challenge the Elite Four and the League Champion. What is interesting about Sinnoh is Team Galactic with its leader Cyrus. Their aim was to recreate the entire Pokémon universe into a utopia without spirit by summoning the legendary Dialga and Palkia to alter time and space. Unable to handle them, the Lake Guardians could not interfere in the plans. Nevertheless, when all seemed lost, the banished Giratina swapped Cyrus, Dialga, and Palkia to prevent the destruction of the Pokémon and Distortion worlds. Giratina returned back to its world, and Lucas or Dawn followed after. Thanks to some help from Mesprith, Azelf, Uxi, and Cynthia, Lucas or Dawn were able to navigate through the gravity-defying environments. There it was, Arceus's banished and misunderstood creation, Giratina. The legendary and infamous Pokémon was a tough foe, but in the end, 
Lucas or Don weakened it enough to be captured, called, and then used in the final battles against the Elite Four and the current champion, Cynthia. With these victories, the time had come to awaken and catch the legendary titans, Reggie Rock, Reg Ice, Reggie Steel, and finally, Reggie Gigas at Snow Point Temple. A few years passed until a new trainer, Hilbert, set off on his quest in the Unova region. Similarly to the previous cases, this region had also its plague, Team Plasma. Claiming to fight for the freedom of Pokémon, it soon turned out that their leader, Getsus' true aim was to be the only trainer left with Pokémon. Learning about this, Hilbert was called by one of the legendary dragons to rise up against N. Getsus' right hand and adopted son. It soon turned out that N had the opposing dragon, leading to a decisive battle between the two. As a result of his defeat, N realized his mistake, turned against Team Plasma and Getsus. With Plasma out of the way, Hilbert went on to claim the title as Unova League Champion. Nevertheless, similarly to the disillusion of Team Rocket, the destruction of Plasma was nothing else but wishful thinking. As two years after their presumed defeat and dissolution, a new trainer, Nate, encountered them and learned about their new target, takeover of the Unova region. Infuriated by his past defeat and the new nuisance, Getsus decided to utilize Qrem to clear his path to rule and get rid of any opponents, including Nate. In that moment, the remorseful N appeared to save the young trainer, but instead fell into his former superior's trap. Following this great act of sacrifice, Nate was left alone, but accepted the challenge and defeated once and for all Getsus and the dragon. With the threat out of his way, Nate finally took the step to become Unova Champion, and as a gesture of gratitude, received the remaining dragon from N. Afterwards, he went on to compete in the Champions Tournament of the Pokémon World Tournament in the Unova region, where among many challengers was Red from Kanto. The Unova Chronicles conclude the non-Mega Evolution timelines, the most straightforward universes of the Pokémon multiverses. The multiverses begins with the war in Kalos but the effects of this multiverse can first be seen in Kanto and with the first generation. Here we have additional alternate universes under the Mega Evolution multiverses, that of Pokémon Origins and Pokémon Let's Go. Let's begin with Pokémon Origins and Red's adventure across Kanto, which went on just like in the non-Mega Evolution Kanto universes until the battle against Mewtwo was in reality lost after Charizard and Red were sent out flying. It was in this desperate situation that Red's Keystone responded and Charizard Mega evolved. With its newfound powers, Red and Mega Charizard single-handedly weakened Mewtwo and served him cornered on a silver plate to Red, who then caught the legendary, though cloned, Pokémon. Now to the mainline Mega Evolution timeline that we, for the most part, will follow for the rest of this video. So let's go! In the province of Kanto, where Mega Evolution exists, you caught, depending on the universe, a Pikachu or an Eevee and went on the same path as Red had in Origins, visiting the eight gyms and gym leaders of Kanto, battling Team Rocket and among them the most recognizable grunt members. Jesse and James. As what was the case in the non-Mega Evolution universe, the male or female trainer made their way across the land, solved the mystery in Lavender Town by kicking out Team Rocket, traversed to Cinnabar Island and learned about the existence of Mewtwo. From here, while flying or surfing their way through Kanto, the boy or girl then challenged the Team Rocket Mafia boss and leader of the Viridian City Gym. Giovanni twice. After his defeat, the path was cleared to Victory Road, the Indigo Plateau, the Elite Four, and finally, Champion Battle. Even so, the Champion title was only the beginning of the battle as in this iteration of Kanto, Red, 
blue, and green were also present and bent on challenging the young trainer champion. The same went for the 150 master trainers who were ready to test the abilities of our selected male or female trainer after catching all of the Pokémon in the Pokédex, including the legendary Articuno, Zapdos, and Moltres, Mewtwo, the mythical Meltan, and Melmetal, and even Mew? Things for sure turned out differently in this reality. In the Hoenn region, Team Magma or Team Aqua managed to use the blue or red orbs to awaken Primal Groudon or Primal Kyogre. Unlike in the non-Mega Evolution universe, Rayquaza was never summoned to stop the individual legendary Pokémon as Brendan or May managed to calm down Primal Groudon and Primal Kyogre in time. However, there was another threat that was targeting the Pokémon world out from space the Meteoroid. Originally, Zinnia, a Pokémon trainer of the ancient Draconid tribe, had infiltrated Team Magma and Team Aqua in order to awaken Pokémon Groudon and Kyogre and then call Rayquaza back to Hoenn to destroy the approaching Meteoroid. When this couldn't happen due to Brendan's or May's actions, she changed her plan and broke into Professor Birch's home to steal May's keystone. Learning about this, the fresh Hoenn League champion set out to battle Zinnia, who in order to prevent a teleportation of the oncoming Meteoroid to the non-Mega Evolution multiverse of Mega Evolution Hoenn, destroyed the device and revealed her big secret at Sky Pillar. Zinnia told May about Rayquaza, and the two teamed up to summon the legendary Pokémon with the Keystones. Nevertheless, in an unexpected turn of events, Rayquaza was too weak to Mega Evolve, and it was first after it was given Meteorite to consume that the evolution finally took place. May then battled and captured Mega Rayquaza, used it to flow out to space, destroyed the approaching Meteorite, then battled and captured Deoxys at the edge of space. Zinnia had already left Sky Pillar leaving only a note to Brendan or May thanking for freeing her from a lifelong duty. After the Delta incident, two new trainers in the province of Kalos were about to select their starter Pokémon from Professor Sycamore and head out to collect the badges required to enter the Kalos Pokémon League. Though at first it looked like this would be a regular Pokémon adventure for Serena and Callum, things quickly turned sour as they faced the ideological syndicate Team Flare, run by the self-made billionaire and philanthropist Lysander. To cover his underground operation and his true aim to purify the world and destroy Kalos, Lysander for a while kept his facade as an admired, innovative, and successful citizen. Serena or Callum continued their struggles for the gym leader badges, and along the way gained a special Lucario, a Mega Ring, and then learned to use the power of Mega Evolution. Nevertheless, by the time either of the two trainers had gained their badges from the second to last gym leader Olympia, Lysander announced his plans for Kalos. Being witness to this televised announcement, Serena or Callum challenged Lysander and discovered the imprisoned and immortal AZ. Lysander then intervened and informed about AZ and his involvement in the Kalos War 3,000 years prior and went on to manipulate either of the young trainers to defeat his scientist, Zerosic. But this was just a setup as Lysander's true goal was to create a better world and remove anyone who opposed him. Infuriated, Callum or Serena took on Lysander using the newly acquired Mega Stone caught the legendary Pokémon Xerneas, or Evatol, and left Lysander to be destroyed by his own ego and the so-called ultimate weapon. Full of confidence and determination, Serena or Callum conquered the last gem leader Wolfric, conquered their way through Victory Road, and crushed the Elite Four in the Kalos Pokémon League and the champion Diantha. A true legend had finally reached her goal of becoming the Pokémon Master of Kalos, caught 50% Zygarde, 
and even was responsible for the heartwarming reunion between the former King AZ and his Floette. After the events in Kalos and the Alola Islands region, Lily smuggled out the mysterious Cosmog out of a mysterious laboratory. Three months passed, and Sun or Moon, who had just moved from Kanto, and Kahuna Hala's grandson, Hao, selected two of the Alola starter Pokemon Rowlet, Litten, or Poplio. Naturally, just like every other province, the Alola Islands also had a criminal team named Skull that was after valuable Pokemon. After the first skirmish against its grunts, Sun or Moon received a stone, which was then carved into a powerful Z-ring by Hao's grandfather, Hala. Unlike the other provinces, Alola didn't have designated town gyms. Instead, they had island challenges and kahuna battles. Upon completing the first set of challenges in the trial, Sun or Moon headed to Akala Island and received a Zygarde core. Shortly after Sun or Moon faced Kahuna Olivia and were shortly after introduced to Lusamine, the powerful president of the Aether Foundation. At the Foundation's headquarters, they were introduced to their work of protecting and healing Pokémon from the clutches of Team Skull and its enforcer, Gladion. And after facing UB-1, the origin of the Ultra Beasts, the UB originated from an alternate dimension, the Ultra Space, and arrived to Alola through an Ultra Wormhole. Following this lesson about the UB, Sun or Moon faced the Team Skull leader, Guzma, but could not prevent Team Skull, Plumeria, from taking Lily and Cosmog away. Luckily, as all seemed lost, Team Skull defector Gladion showed up and brought the three to the Aether base where it was revealed that Cosmog was an Ultra Beast capable of opening Ultra Wormholes, that Team Skull's leader had collaborated with Lusami to unleash the Ultra Beast on Alola and finally, that Lily and Gladion were Lusamine's children. Lusamine was stopped in time, and Cosmog was spared from death, but Lusamine and Guzma escaped through the closing wormhole to the Ultra Space. Time was about to run, and Sun or Moon hurried to the altar of Sun or Moon to reawaken Cosmog and transform it into either the legendary Lunala or Sol Galeo and open the wormhole to the Ultra Space. There, Guzma and Lusamine awaited their arrival for a final battle between Sun or Moon and the corrupted fusion of Lusamine and Nihilego, UB-1. From here, with either Lunala or Solgaleo at their disposal, Sun or Moon made their way to Mount Lanakila to conquer the Elite Four of the newly established Alola Pokémon League, and then face Professor Kukui for the champion title. Sun or Moon kept calm, carried on, and finally challenged and defeated Kukui, and was crowned as the first champion of Alola. Shortly after, Looker, the international police officer, approached Sun or Moon and Kukui with a task to hunt down the remaining UBs and drop the bombshell that his partner Annabelle was a human faller from another world who ended up in this world through an ultra wormhole. But this was merely the beginning as Looker continued to explain that UBs didn't voluntarily come to this world and that Annabelle, who inherits a strong Ultra Wormhole aura, had been recruited by the UB Police Special Task Force as UB Bait. In fact, Annabelle originally derived from the Hoenn region in a different universe where Mega Evolution does not exist. Upon hunting down and catching all the remaining UBs, he battled Mega Evolution Universe Red and Blue who were visiting Alola for the battle trait, and then gained the respect of the island spirit Tapu. Lily thanked Sun or Moon and then departed for Kanto in order to find a cure for her mother. Now, if having multiple alternate universes within each game and a clear-cut division between universes where Mega Evolution exists wasn't enough, you also have alternate universes in the Mega Evolution universes that can be connected by Ultra Wormholes. So in an alternative universe to the one we just went over, a nearly identical adventure was about to unfold. 
Well, with the exception of the presence of many more Ultra Beasts, the Ultra Recon Squad, and the fact that Lusamine aimed to locate the ultra-dangerous Necrozma and then ended up being thrown out of the same wormhole. Necrozma then merged with Lunala and Solgaleo, while other ultra-wormholes threw out more and more Ultra Beasts. You see, while the wormholes could connect different parallel universes, it primarily connected the Ultra Space with the Ultra Recon Squad's home city of Ultra Megalopolis. There, this world sun or moon faced Dusk Mane or Dawn Wings Necrozma to free Solgaleo or Lunala at Megalo Tower. Just like in the parallel universe, either sun or moon went on to become the first league champion of Alola. Not long after Mega Evolution, Team Rocket's former boss Giovanni was brought to Alola through an ultra wormhole from Mega Evolution Kanto. Not wasting any time, he rapidly joined forces with Aether Foundation's Faba to overthrow Lusami and found Rainbow Rocket, a criminal syndicate with the leader from all the previously mentioned criminal teams. Team Rocket, Giovanni. Team Aqua, Archie. Team Magma, Maxi. Team Galactic, Cyrus. Team Plasma, Getsis. Team Flare, Lysander, who had been brought in from parallel universes and multiverses through Ultra Wormholes, and Aether's Faba from Alola. Together with Lily, Sun, or Moon, defeated all of Rainbow Rocket and liberated the imprisoned Lusamine, while Giovanni continued to travel among alternate universes. As for Pokémon Sword and Shield and the Galar region, the timeline or multiverse placement is more unclear. Much points to a clear reboot and the introduction of a new multiverse. Though the other regions are there, and we have a few clues which can guide us. One of them are the special Pokémon from Pokémon Let's Go and the only Kanto Meowth which can be imported into the game. Another are references to other regions in the world of Pokémon. Though throughout the entire game, there is only a single mention of them by Sonya, and even then the young professor does not mention specifically Kanto, Johto, Hoenn, Sinnoh, Unova, Kalos, or Alola, or any of the famous professors from these. Furthermore, neither the post-game nor the battle tower has any trainers or champions from outside Galar and there are no signs or references to the other leagues and champions that we have reappeared in past Pokémon titles. Finally, there is the matter of Mega Evolution, which doesn't exist in Galar, unlike what was the case in Kanto, Hoenn, Kalos, and Alola, or Z-moves in Alola. Instead, Galar had Dynamaxing and Gigantamaxing, and both of these go back to ancient times when it was a plague in the region. As such, it appears that Pokémon Sword and Shield is either at the end of the non-Mega Evolution universe, or more likely introduces a brand new multiverse and a soft reboot to the Pokémon franchise. Long ago in ancient times, two brothers watched a falling wishing star when on the darkest day disaster struck. A great black storm covered Galar, and under Eternatus's influence, Gigantamax Pokémon ran rampant, crushing everything in their path. It was then that two legendary Pokémon, Zashin and Zamazenta, with their sword and shield, prevented disaster and paved the way to the throne for the two brothers. They in turn made Hammerlock their capital and erected a giant memorial to commemorate the grand victory. Many centuries passed, and the memory of the two legendary Pokémon slowly faded away. This was in part due to the efforts of later royal descendants who aimed to rewrite history and hide all traces and memorials of Zashin and Zamazenta. Good examples here are the tapestries in Hammerlock's vault and the boulder and mural in Stoan side, placed to cover the statues hiding behind. At one unspecified point, the old monarchy was dissolved. Then you had Rose, who rose to prominence as founder of the Macro Cosmos Corporation, chairman of the Galar League, and by popularizing Dynamaxing after it was rediscovered and brought under control by Professor Magnolia. Most of all, though, Rose was obsessed with the dormant power from Hammerlock's Tower, and the entire castle was most likely turned into a stadium and an energy plant. 
The construction of this facility caused the need for a new capital, a modern metropolis designed and developed by Chairman Rose. Here in Winden, the previously endorsed by Rose, Leon, rose to prominence, was crowned champion, and with his Charizard, remained undefeated for years to come. A fact which ignited Hop, his younger brother's ambition to one day be the one that would dethrone him. Following an exhibition match with his rival Ryan, Leon returned to Wedgehurst to promote the upcoming Galar Gym Challenge, and then outside his home, handed Hop and Victor or Gloria their starter Pokemon, Grookey, Scorbunny, or Sobble. Upon their first battle as rivals, Victor or Gloria and Hop followed a loose Wooloo into the slumbering weld, where the two fresh trainers faced a mysterious Pokemon which was completely untouchable. This encounter intrigued Sonia and her grandmother, Professor Magnolia, and put pressure on Leon to endorse both Hop and Victor or Gloria for the upcoming gym challenge. Leon, though, was skeptical and demanded another match which convinced him. Then, like in ancient times, two wishing stars fell down for the two young trainers, and Professor Magnolia quickly affixed them to Dynamax bands to increase the new challenger's odds in Galar's gyms. Waving their goodbyes, Hop and Victor or Gloria set off for the opening ceremony at Motostoke Stadium. The train, however, ran into a flock of Wooloo, who blocked the further path from the vast wild area. This didn't bother the fresh trainers in the slightest, in particular since Sonia followed to investigate the Dynamax phenomenon and the events of the darkest day. Who would remain an obstacle, though, was Team Yell, the passionate fans of gym challenger Marnie and the source of her greatest embarrassment. Well, them and gym challenger B, who Chairman Rose had personally endorsed. Victor or Gloria set out to collect the first three gym badges in the stadiums in Turfield, Hullberry, and Motostoke, and on the way explored the darkest day geoglyph in Turfield with Sonia. Determined, Victor or Gloria entered the stadiums and pulled out Dynamax victories against Milo, Nessa, and Kabu, claimed the grass, water, and fire badges, and was even invited for dinner with Sonia, Chairman Rose, and his secretary, Oleana. With the first three badges secured, Milo, Nessa, and Kabu waved their goodbyes and wished the best of luck on the journey across the northern wild area to Hammerlock and the second half of the gym challenge. There, Chairman Rose explained in detail how the plant in the city worked by generating energy from Hammerlock Stadium's tower, and Sonia went over some old tapestries depicting the circumstances behind the founding of the former Kingdom of Galar. Though one question remained, were the sword and shield wielded by the brothers or Pokémon? The answer was revealed underneath the mural in Stow on Side, which Bede had destroyed. Nonetheless, this act of vandalism greatly upset Chairman Rose, who decided to withdraw his endorsement of Bede. Victor or Gloria went on to Dynamax and later Gigantamax, their Pokémon, to defeat the next gym leaders, Bede, Opal, Gordy, Piers, and finally Raihan, to claim the Fighting, Fairy, Rock, Dark, and Dragon badges, complete the gym challenge, and qualify for the Champion Cup in Winden. The battles against Marnie and Hop went well, and Victor or Gloria qualified for the final cup, but then Leon went missing. Eventually, they tracked him down to Rose's Tower, where they took on Macrocosmos's Oleana, but failed to convince Leon to confront Rose, Macrocosmos's CEO there and then. Instead, the naive champion was outwitted by his chairman under the false promise to delay his energy experiment until after the Champion Cup was concluded. Rose, however, had no intention to delay his plan, and while everyone was occupied with Victor or Gloria's matches against B and the other gym leaders, he released Eternatus from its imprisonment and lost control. Just as the title match was about to begin, the chairman interrupted, not to wish luck, but inform that things had gotten out of hand with Eternatus, causing Pokémon to Dynamax in a number of Galar stadiums. Angered Leon headed straight for the tower in Hammerlock, while the challenger with Hop returned back with Sonya to locate in the slumbering weld the legendary Pokémon who halted the darkest day. 
Unfortunately, instead of Zashin and Zamazenta, Victor or Gloria and Hop only found their resting place and a rusted sword and shield. Even so, they shared the spoils and brought them up to the top of Hammerlock after defeating Chairman Rose, who confessed to awakening the dangerous Eternatus. Victor or Gloria and Hop arrived just when Leon was brought down to his knees, forcing his younger brother and the title challenger to finish the battle with Eternatus. Together, they continued to weaken the monstrosity, but as it appeared that victory was in sight, a Gigantamaxing turned the odds. Completely untouchable Gloria and Hop combined their rusted sword and shield and called upon Zashin and Zamazenta, who joined the two trainers in their Pokémon for the mother of all Max raid battles. With their help, Victor or Gloria finally caught Eternatus, and then go up against Leon with his Charizard and the fully evolved starter that everyone overlooked. The undefeated champion was toppled from the throne in an incredible showdown, and with it the time arrived to return the rusted sword and shield. Just then, as Victor or Gloria, Hop and Sonya were reminiscing over their long adventure, the darkest day in Zashin and Zamazenta, two descendants of the deposed royal family, Swordward and Shieldbert showed up, insulted Professor Sonya, told that they would restore the monarchy, took one of the rusted weapons from Hop and hurried off to Turfield, Hallberry, Stow on Side, Sir Chester, and finally Hammerlock Stadium to Dynamax a number of innocent Pokémon. While Victor or Gloria were occupied calming down these, Swordward and Shieldbert abused the rusted sword or shield to call upon Zashin or Zamazenta to cause havoc. When it refused and instead went after Swordward or Shieldbert and Hop, Zashin or Zamazenta came down, calmed down its counterpart, and then accepted to be caught by Victor or Gloria. Hop then rushed to the slumbering weld and was accepted by the remaining legendary setting the stage for one final time battle with his original rival and now champion of Galar to conclude a long journey. The only thing that remained for the champion was to complete the challenges and catch the legendary Pokémon of the Isle of Armor and the many within the Crown Tundra before heading back for Rose's Tower where among many, Leon waited once again. And we made it! The end of long and complicated timelines of non-Mega Evolution, Mega Evolution, and possibly even more multiverses with a number of multiverses for each of the games. The Pokémon timeline or multiverses are no doubt complex and took a long time to make, so be sure to leave a like, subscribe to Commonwealth Realm, and press that notification bell if you haven't already. So we can surpass 300,000 subscribers as soon as possible, less than 7,000 to go, before we will give away a Switch OLED with game. Last but not least, we need more of you to support us on patreon.com slash common realm, so that you can join the ranks just like our royal producer Charles Shash, and please enjoy one or both of these two awesome videos. <laughs>